Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. It is time for another Ask a Crafter. And this week I am going to be working on that same batch of questions that I was working on last week. And I will put a link in the video description if you want to submit questions for the next batch of Ask a Crafter videos that I'll do in a few weeks. Um, this first question comes from Faith Friend, and I want to just let you know that from this batch of questions, any question that had more than 10 thumbs ups are the ones that I'm answering. So when you leave your question on the Ask Your Crafter thread, make sure you give a thumbs up to the questions that you like. That way um, I'll know what people are really interested in. And um, if it's a question I've answered before, I may skip it though, so I just want to want to put that out there. Um, a faith friend asks, I have too many hobbies. How do you budget time to do them all? Do you say Mondays for watercolor, Tuesdays for stamping, card making, etc., Or do you just go with what you're feeling at the time or what you haven't done in a while? Um, I go by whatever I feel like creating. Now I used to be very, um, uh, kind of, I, I would be guided what to create by what, um, cause I used to do a lot of sponsorships on my YouTube channel. So a lot of times what I would create would be dependent on what, um, I had been hired to create with. So if a stamp company hired me to do a video with some new stamps in their shop, I would be using them. If a watercolor company hired me to do a, do a painting with their paints, I would work with that. But, um, but often I just, I just create with what I create with. Even if I do, even, even though normally I do, well, I was doing like watercolors on Wednesday and I was doing, you know, sketchbook work on Sunday and things like that. I, I still would tend to film them whenever I felt like filming them. So if I was in a, a like a really in a, in a groove to paint with watercolors, I might paint, you know, two or three watercolors that day. And I would parse them out on my channel whenever, you know, to kind of spread them out a little bit, like once a week. But for my own creating, if I was in the mood to play with colored pencils, I might play with colored pencils straight for three days and then, you know, move on to something else. And then uh, because I do post a lot of the things that I create on YouTube, I would just um, kind of spread them out. So I don't post in the order of what I record, but I like to do with whatever I'm feeling, um, whatever I'm feeling passionate about creating with, because I feel like it's more fun. It's more fun if you can, if you can let your joy guide you. So that's just me. Um, when I was teaching classes, you know, I would have like, I'd have drawing and watercolors for ages, you know, 10 to 15 on Monday. So obviously that would be what I would work on in those classes. But for what I was working on my own personal time, it would be whatever I felt like. And a lot of times I'm doing mixed media, which opens the door for me to paint with whatever I want, whatever I want. So a lot of times it's watercolor plus a uh, color pencil, maybe acrylic paint pen, or uh, it might be just be straight oils, or it might be pastels with a little bit of color pencil, or you know, uh, yeah. I think it's I think it's great to go with go with the flow, go with what you're feeling. Um, but if you feel like you need more of a structure, more of a schedule, you definitely could set up a schedule for yourself. I don't think it has to be all or or nothing. I don't think that um, if you're somebody that really needs that discipline of um, of have, like like if you found that you create you 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 got a lot more done when you were in school when you had like teachers assigning things on each day that might be the way that you're going to be more creative by setting up those boundaries of today is watercolor today is color pencil today is um acrylics but that you know you'll know I'm a very um disciplined person by nature so I, I'll just say I'm going to go create and I'll create with what I want to create with but if I am feeling wishy-washy and I'm having a hard time getting going I might just say okay no you're going to use this and you're going to make it work so I think if you're, I think you just got to go with what your personality is. And, um, and yeah, a lot of people just create with one medium and that's that, and that's fine too. So they might change up their subjects or, uh, or whatnot. But I, but personally, I like to go with whatever I'm feeling passionate about. Um, and that's one of the reasons I stopped doing so many sponsored videos because I felt like I really wanted to just go with where my joy was because, um, even though I might not be getting sponsors, um, more people are enjoying my videos and it's making up the difference in, um, in YouTube ads and stuff, so because I do this for a living, which probably isn't your concern if you're um, if you're doing it as a hobby or if you're selling your work and it's and actually if you're selling your work, then you probably really want to create with whatever you feel passionate about creating with because it will show in your work. Um, let's see, this one is by a Frady. <laughs> I'm telling you, some of these uh, YouTube handles are tough to pronounce, so I apologize if I get it wrong. Lindsay, some years ago you posted a recipe for a permanent gel plate using gelatin, glycerin, and water. Have the plant, uh, have the plates held up? Do you still have them, or did you turn to the commercially available ones and abandon the idea of the homemade gel plate? 
Great question. Um, yeah, I have abandoned my homemade one. I don't think it's a bad idea, but I love the convenience and the durability of the commercial ones. And I love to have a bunch going at once. So I've switched over to commercial ones. Uh, but many of my students are YouTube viewers that made the, the glycerin and gelatin gel plate. Um, they're still using theirs. If it gets dirty or damaged, they just microwave it, melt it down, repour it and use it again start fresh but um but yeah they've been using theirs for years i i also uh storage was an issue and the commercial gel plates gel presses and jelly arts plates they come in these clamshell packages that are so nice for storing them and i can have a bunch on a shelf and i think i've collected i think i've collected every size except at 12 by 12 because i have a 12 by 14. um i have actually have two eight inch rounds because i wasn't sure if i had that size and i was at a stamp show and uh and there was a cute booth it was joggles actually and i really wanted to buy something there i did buy some of the stencils but i also bought a gel plate because i was i was well, i was taking advantage of one of their demos and i'm like i gotta buy something <laughs> and like i and you know i when when we're not in a pandemic i like to have friends over and just cover the tables with gel plates and let you know have a gel print party it's so much fun uh, because a lot of my friends don't have gel plates or if they do they don't really want the big mess at their house so they can come over here <laughs> and they can make a mess in my studio because hey it's always a mess well i clean up every day but i messes all the time i'm not bothered by it um so there's that uh yeah it works i have to say that i feel like a homemade gel plate you get a better print if you're really interested in a uh, more high definition print. I do believe the homemade gelatin plates make a better print than the gel presses, which are made with a mineral oil product. So, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's totally up to you. They're both, they're both good. Um, let's see. Chris Featherson asks, what's a medium you found the most challenging to work with? Oh boy. Um, hmm. There's always something, and it's usually not a particular medium. It's usually like a particular product that I'm like kind of Yosemite Sam cursing the whole way through. I'm trying to think. Uh, it's usually something where drying time is an issue. Either it's drying too fast or too slow. Um, gosh, I have to say, I think alcohol markers are a very challenging medium. I really enjoy them, but Dad, they're challenging. I would say alcohol markers. I would say specifically bullet and chisel tip alcohol markers because they have a much steeper learning curve than the brush and chisel alcohol markers. So I'd probably say that they're probably the most the most challenging, definitely the steepest learning curve. Um, I would say probably the least intuitive as well. Now I haven't used egg tempera, but I think that would be a very challenging medium for me uh, because of the tiny little strokes like of uh, all the cross hatching you have to do and the instant drying, I don't think that would be my cup of tea. Um, I tend not to go for like friggy slow moving projects, but uh, I would say alcohol markers probably because they they dry pretty fast and blending those uh, the chisel and bullet tip markers are a bit challenging. Um, but I also really enjoy it, so eh, th that's my answer. If that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. Um, oh, baking crystals. For all of you parents out there that think it'll be fun to eat your children those baking crystal sun catcher kits, that's child abuse, don't do it. <laughs> that's haunting me. I was emotionally scarred from the baking crystal sun catcher projects of my youth. <laughs> but as an adult, I'll call markers. <laughs> oh boy. I'm gonna get sued by the baking crystal people. I don't even know who makes those anymore. <laughs> okay, disclaimer, I have no ill will against the baking crystals. I'm sure they're fine. <laughs> You are melting plastic in your oven, though. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Um, Clark Fine Art asks, Lindsay, when creating a split primary palette in watercolors, what are your favorite colors to use, and do you just do six, or are there a few bonus colors you can't live without? Um, okay, this is really long. It goes on a lot further, but that's the gist of the comment. Um, what I recommend, actually, nowadays... Um, and this is funny because I was thinking about actually pulling out one of my old palettes and using the old split primary palette I used to use, but the colors have come so far in the last 20 years. But my first split primary palette that I used to teach with way back in the day, back when I was the art director over at the Hammond Street Senior Center, I used to use uh, Prussian Blue, Ultramarine Blue, Cadmium Red, uh, Alizarin Crimson, Lemon Yellow, and cadmium yellow, which is kind of strange because I don't use those colors anymore. I use ultramarine blue, but the other colors um, I don't because lemon yellow tends to be kind of weak. It was a titan nickel titan titan 
lemon. Um, cadmium red and cadmium yellow are somewhat opaque, so you don't get the cleanest mixes, um, which is probably why I I have a good, and, and this probably sounds really conceited, but I have a really good eye for color and a really good uh, ability to mix without mud, and I think it's probably because I use that very traditional watercolor palette, which could go muddy very easily because of the opacity of the cadmium colors in the ultramarine, and even Prussian blue. But the reason I don't use that palette anymore is because Prussian blue is, uh, it's, it's light reactive. Um, it's not 100% fugitive in the sense of the world word where it's, um, fugitive means one which runs away. That, so a fugitive color is a color that runs away, the color goes away. Um, Prussian blue can be reactivated by putting it in a dark room and it will come back. Um, but alizarin crimson is a very fugitive color if you're using traditional true alizarin crimson. So what I use now, I actually recommend the Daniel Smith Essentials set, which you can find in five milliliter tubes on any art supply seller. Usually Amazon is cheapest, but they use they use um, ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, uh, it's phthalo blue green shade, which is what it usually is. You rarely ever see a phthalo blue red shade in, the, in a kit like that. Um, it is pyrrole scarlet rather than cadmium red. Pyrrole scarlet's uh, less toxic, cheaper, and um, not th I don't think cadmiums are a real toxicity problem in watercolors, the way some people make it out, but anyway. Um, it uh, It's a cleaner. It's a cleaner red because it's more transparent. Um, quinacridone rose instead of alizarin crimson because it's a little bit pinker, it's cleaner, it's more vibrant, and it's less fugitive. Uh, I use Hansa Yellow Light, or uh, I also like M. Graham's Cadmium Lemon a lot, but it is a cadmium, so there's that opacity factor, but Hansa Yellow Light is gorgeous, super transparent, and um, well, it's, it's very transparent. Yellows tend to be your some of your problems with real transparent yellows. I know it sounds weird, you think yellows are so weak, they're always transparent, but not necessarily in watercolor if it's a quality color. Um, Gamboge, new Gamboge, I should say, um, because again, it's more transparent. You could also use Indian yellow because that's quite transparent as well for a warm yellow. So those six colors. Um, so the Daniel Smith set is just ideal. You can get it all in one shot. Now other colors that I add to that palette, just for convenience, because I can be, diff well, you can make some earthy colors, but for a beginner, it can be very difficult, and plus it's just it's just time consuming, and you don't get some of the beautiful granulations that you will get like with uh, burnt sienna or burnt umber, depending on the brand. I don't like Winsor Newton's burnt sienna. I prefer their burnt umber because their burnt sienna is PR 101, and it's too red. Uh, so I like a PBR, PBR7 burnt sienna, or I'll get a burnt umber. I can use either because you can always warm it up if you need to. Um, sap green, I love Amgram sap green, or if you've got Windsor and Newton, their olive green is better. If you've got Sennelier, their olive green is better. Um, and I like to have yellow ochre because I feel like yellow ochre just makes the world better. It just makes everything a little bit warmer and prettier and just, it adds a richness to the colors. Um, so, and I did use burnt sienna, sap green, and yellow ochre as additions to my old split primary palette, which I don't recommend anymore because, you know, I don't think that the quinacridone colors were as well known and as well used. I learned how to paint in the early 80s with my teacher, Mrs. Turner, so I was taught on a very traditional watercolor um, lesson, lesson plan, so I was using the traditional colors of the old masters, so, you know, using ultramarine, Prussian blue, alizarin crimson, cadmium red, cadmium yellow. Um, it was just a much more, uh, it was just much more common because the quinacridones hadn't really uh, proven themselves to be light fast colors and kind of come onto the scene so much. Or maybe my teacher was still set in the ways of learning to paint, you know, in the 50s and 60s and, you know, it gets passed down. Uh, I'm glad I learned that way because I feel like I avoid a lot of the trappings of having uh, having always had access to those super vibrant quinacridone and phthalo cyan colors. Um, starting with that more muted, softer uh, watercolor range, you have to be extremely intentional with your mixing, otherwise you end up with, um, with mud. So I don't regret that I learned the way I learned, <clears throat> but um, it's not what I recommend now. I recommend more of a modern watercolor palette. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, this one is 32 thumbs up by Balanced Vitality. Uh, what are the best ways to practice or grow art uh, when your time to devote to it is limited, meaning you need to get the most out of available time? A homeschooling mom with littles in the mix. Well, you know what's gonna make your, your art better than anything you could possibly do, and it's cheap, if not necessarily free, you probably have everything you need at home, drawing. 
learning to draw. If you want to make the most of your time, pencil and paper, man, your kid, or charcoal and paper, Conte crayon and paper, you know, pencil and paper, you are going to, you can do a full value range with a nice soft pencil and a white piece of paper. Um, and you do not have all, you're not going to waste time on deciding about color. Value is way more important than color anyway. So draw. I would definitely draw. If you're, if that just idea makes you want to cringe, then um, I would say, how about watercolor? Or even watercolor pencils, because you can set up and be, watercolor pencils and a water brush, you can be, you know, you could be doing a quick sketch and illustration while your kids are working on their homework. You know, you can make use of those tiny little snippets of time and not have to have a ton of stuff out. Uh, but still, I'd say sketchbook and, and pencil. That's really going to be the most time effective. You're going to get the most bang for your buck, money-wise and time-wise. Um, and draw anything. Draw your kids as they're like doing their homework. Draw your pets. Draw a cup on a table. Draw whatever you see. And that's going to get you better. It may not make the art that you are desiring to make, but you're going to build your skills so that when you have the time, you have that chunk of time to devote to a painting, you're going to be so much better trained to do it. Um, Annette Fournier, whoa, 46 thumbs up on this one. Is there a difference in technique painting watercolor on wood pulp paper as opposed to cotton paper? And are all cotton papers good or all wood pulp difficult? Oh, absolutely not. Um, well, there are some different techniques, but I think you adapt your techniques to whatever paper you have. It was so funny. Um, there was a, there was a, a viewer in one of the groups on, on Facebook. Um, one of my viewers, Joe Maisky, started a group called the Lindsay's Frugality is Frugalites, Lindsay's Frugalites, and they share work that they've done for my tutorials. It's so nice. It's super nice. And, um, and I don't want to like, I don't know, I don't know if I should say your name. But anyways, this very talented artist in the group, she bought some, she's probably, if you're watching, you know who you are, um, she bought some Canson XL watercolor paper, which is not bad, but it's not the best, and it is, um, it's wood pulp paper, and it's like 30 sheets for $5 at AC Moore, back when AC Moore was around, but it's, I think, $10 regular price anyway, so cheap paper, and she's like, I gotta use this paper up so that I can graduate onto my arches, so I, I want to buy some arches and use that, but I gotta use this cheap stuff up first. And she got so good at using that Canson XL paper that she's like, well, geez, now I've got to buy another pack of it because her work was so beautiful on that cheap wood pulp paper because she adapted her technique for it. So I don't think it's um, it's different techniques, but you definitely adapt your technique. Like cotton paper can take a lot more water. It can take a lot more scrubbing. Um, you can uh, glaze more on it, layer more on it. So you can use those techniques, whereas... Um, and on a wood pulp paper, you kind of got to get it on your first try more often. You don't have as much um, layering and as much and much abuse that the paper will take before it starts to pill. So um, it's just different techniques. You might you probably become a better painter working on the uh, the cheaper paper because you don't get so many undo. You can't scrub back so many times if you make an error. So. Um, they're just different factors. Like if I know I'm doing a quick sketch, I'm using my, you know, cheap Arteza sketchbooks because I know they're going to handle that, the amount of layers I'm going to put on there, which isn't many. If I know I'm going to do something where I want to spend, um, I want to do lots of layers, I'm going to spend some time, I'm going to use a uh, tried and true paper like Fabriano Artistico or Hannah Cezanne or Arches. I'm going to use something that can take that abuse, that can take reworking if I need to. So it just depends on, uh, for me, the subject and the amount of time I'm going to spend because they do it's not that they take a different approach, but you don't have as many chances to redo it on wood pulp paper, I would say, which is more affordable, but can make you a better painter. Just like any time when you're using less than perfect supplies, you have to, you bridge the gap with your talent and your skill when your supplies aren't as good. Um, let's see, this will be the last question for this video. This is from Amanda Panda. Are, is there any supplies that expire? You can't use them after a certain date. Um, I don't think, there's not like a best buy date on your supplies and it's not like a, uh, if your supplies are still workable, they're still workable, you can still use them. Um, resin, after a certain amount of time, I would say after, I wouldn't buy resin if you can't use it up within six months because it can go hard in the jar. I've had that happen with polyester resin. Um, I haven't happened to, ha had it happen with epoxy resin, but I have had epoxy resin go yellow. So, um, I would definitely say don't stock up on that, buy it as you need it. Um, watercolor paints are good indefinitely. Colored pencils usually good indefinitely. Pastels good indefinitely. Well, I say soft pastels or pastel pencils good indefinitely. Oil pastels could dry out a bit and be less pleasurable to use, but they should still work. They just be a little drier and harder. 
Um, acrylic paints can get chunky, especially the craft paints as they have a higher water content as they evaporate. I've noticed they can get like big chunks in the in the bottles because you get air in the bottles whereas a tube of acrylic paint you squish out the air as you squish out the paint so a metal tube acrylic is going to last you a lot longer than a plastic tube acrylic or a craft paint that's in a bottle because there's so much air in there and the plastic tubes can pop back out and hold a lot of air i've noticed so a uh, plastic pouch though like the sennelier abstract art um acrylics or like the uh, arteza um ones in the pouches since you squeeze the air out like you would with a tube they're going to last a lot longer obviously if you're um, maybe not obviously i don't know um if you have if you let your acrylic paints or your glues freeze they're going to be kaput um if you can keep them fairly climate controls are going to last a lot longer but um yeah acrylics can have a shelf life but if they're still not chunky and smooth and they look good then you can use them they're going to be fine you can definitely tell whether something's good or bad uh, oil paints last a long long time as long as they don't go hard in the tube you're good to go um i've seen people paint with their grandparents um oil paints and they're just fine because they haven't gotten air to them so air is kind of the the um enemy of a lot of your paints um so yeah that i would just watch out for glues acrylics and resins but other than that I would be careful. And now there was another question that I don't think had enough thumbs up, so I'm going to tack it onto this because it's related. Somebody asked, should you avoid ordering um, certain products different times of year, like um, because of freezing? Yes, I, I do not order acrylic paint or glue in the winter because I live in Maine and um, things can freeze. I don't order polymer. Actually, I usually just don't order polymer clay because things can get hot in trucks. If it's coming from down south, they could get truck baked. But I definitely would not order polymer clay if I was going to order it in the summer because they could get tr truck baked even in Maine if like a, a UPS truck is just sitting uh, not turned on for a amount of time. Now they probably do prevent that from happening, but just the fact that it could happen, I don't want the aggravation. So um, of course I buy it in stores and who knows, but at least you can kind of squish the package and see if it feels hard or not. Um, but yeah, those, those two are sensitive things to, to cold. Just, I, I would avoid ordering acrylics in the winter if you live someplace cold or if it's coming from someplace cold. Um, generally, your artist grade products can can survive a, f a couple freeze thaw cycles, but not the budget ones and not the craft paints. Those are going to go bad on you. Um, and there, that wraps up this Ask a Crafter. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. Remember, if you want your questions at, uh, answered in an upcoming video, check out the video description for the most current thread and make sure you give the um, the questions you like a thumbs up so I know what is what you guys want to hear answered. Um, and we will see you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Thumbs up before you go, please, on this video. It really helps my channel. And until next time, happy crafting. Bye.